This week, the Luxury Channel journeys to the high Peruvian Andes in search of the precious and endangered vicuña, a delicate antelope-like creature whose fleece produces the most luxurious wool in the entire world. We discover how, through a partnership of the Andean Paisano people, the government of Peru, and one of Italy's most exclusive weavers and fashion houses, the silky fleeced vicuña has been brought back from the very edge of extinction. We will also learn why it is that the soft fur of the vicuña has been known since the time of the Incas as the fiber of the gods, or the golden fleece. Now, the reason why people might think that I love vicuña is because uh, it's difficult to explain. The only way to understand is to go in Peru and, uh, and see one of those. If you see the eyes of a vicuña, very, very difficult you don't fall in love because it's such a sweet animal and uh, it lives in this landscape which is unreal, uh, peaceful and uh, the fabric is, is so superior to anything else. It's always been known as the finest natural fiber you can spin, weave, and, and you can touch, and you can use to do superb products, the, the finest. One of the world's rarest and most precious natural fabrics comes from the Andean vicuña. Found only in the South American high Andes, it has adapted to live at altitudes of 4,500 meters and extreme climatic conditions. The vicuna is the smallest of the South American camelids. There, there are four species. There are two domesticated species, the llama and the alpaca, and two wild species, the guanaco and the vicuna. Uh, the vicuna is a smaller animal and comes from a higher altitude than the other three. Has a, a very, very fine fur. It's, it's half the thickness of the finest sheep's wool. It's very, very fine, very, very silky, and, and insulates superbly. Uh, the, the finer the fur, the more air gets trapped, so the finer the insulation. It is the Vicuña's downy underfleece that produces the rarest and finest of fibers, and at the manufacturing stage, one of the most difficult to weave due to its extraordinarily delicate character. If you think cashmere is luxurious and just gorgeous, once you've tried vicuna, it is soft, it's light, it's warm, it's just the most cuddly thing you can imagine without being bulky. It's just quite fabulous. This vicuna fabric, it's always been shown to me like uh, the best fabric available and was really something that makes you proud of doing your business. Many of the materials and fabrics associated with the luxury goods market are by their very nature contentious. Most luxury fur in the market today involves the death, often painful, of wild animals. Until recently, Western consumption of the vicuña's precious fur was no exception. But today, one company is telling a rather different story. For close on two centuries and over six generations, the Loro Piano family has supplied fashion houses with luxury fabrics from their mills in the mountainous town of Valsesia in northern Italy. In the last few decades, the company has itself branched out into its own exclusive designs and now has over a hundred boutiques worldwide. Today, this family-owned and run business is recognized as the world's leading cashmere processor and the largest single buyer of the finest wools. In recent years, it is the vicuña and its extraordinarily precious fleece that seems to have captured the heart and symbolized the business of Loro Piana. For people living in Peru, vicuña has a special meaning. They are carrying the symbol of vicuña into their national flag. So that animal is particularly important to, to everybody in Peru. Unfortunately, Vicuna got uh, quite a sad story in the, in the past because they were really close to extinction. They were 
killing the vicuna in order to get the, the hair. This is the reason why we decided to commit ourselves to find a way to save uh, vicuna. We thought that the best way to develop again the number of animals in the Andes was to try to make vicuna becoming a useful animal for the population. I think that the answer for why Vicuña is so central to, to Peruvian history and culture is that it has been associated with the inhabitant of the high Andes from immemorial times. In fact, the earliest uh, cave paintings in Torquepala uh, have uh, graphic depictions of the Vicuña. It was always associated with uh, Inca as, as a source of wealth, textile uh, prestige. At the height of the Inca Empire between the 14th and 16th centuries, Vicuña garments were only worn by members of the Inca royalty. The fleece was considered so luxurious and so precious that no one but royalty was permitted to wear the special fur. Vicuña textiles were reserved just for the Inca. A, a Vicuña textile which would be about two meters by one and a half meters was the, was the, the uh, poncho that he wears and he could fold it and have it fit in the, in the fist of his hand. The vicuña was revered as sacred by the ancient Incas. They believed that by safeguarding the vicuña, they could win the sun god's favor, and by revering the creature, the gods would bring warmth and fertility to the earth. It is estimated that the population of the vicuña during Inca times was close to two million. The Inca chaco involved the rounding up of the vicuña and harvesting of its fleece every few years. It was a magical and meticulous ceremony in which up to 30,000 men would form a circle around a huge swathe of the Andean highlands and gradually close in, driving the vicuña into a penned area where they would be sheared and then, if an old male killed for its meat and skin, or in the case of females and younger males, released. The Spanish conquistadors, led by Francisco Pizarro, conquered and then devastated the ancient Inca civilization. Natural resources were plundered. The Vicuña Fleece, the silk of the New World, became highly prized in the old. Lima, the new capital of Peru, flourished its merchants channeling gold and silver, and the fleeces of the alpaca, llama, and vicuña through to Europe. Lima was a small village. It, it was founded in the sort of urban design of, of the Spanish cities. It was very isolated from the rest of the world. The vicuña was hunted to virtual extinction and by the early 1800s, the trade in its soft skin and fleece had all but dried up. Not until Simon Bolivar became governor of Peru in 1824 was any attempt made to protect the animal and the lucrative trade it had produced. Bolivar banned all killing of vicuña and gradually, numbers stabilized. But in the 20th century, the vicuña's fortunes once again took a turn for the worse. At the beginning of the 20th century, and I think it's about 1908, um, Jaeger, which was originally called Dr. Gustav Jaeger's Sanitary Clothing Company, decided, and it was a, a period of when health was all the, the rage, all the thing, and he decided that wools, fine wools, different fibres, helped the body be healthier. He even thought it was a cure for all sorts of obscure diseases. I think he was a little extreme about that. But that's when it first started. And originally, it was layers of different walls, some of it camel hair, some of it vicuna, a mixture of walls in layers were worn. Shackleton wore it to the pearl, as did various smart ladies in, in Central Africa, because they believed that the wool let the skin breathe. And I think that's still true today. The vicuña coat was a great favorite of the Chicago mob. El Capone would wear nothing else. You're looking good and all you get up. 
We know that in the 50s, all the Mafia were striding around New York and Chicago and everything, wearing these fabulous camel-coloured coats by Kuna, very chic. In 1958, Vicuña became the talk of Washington. President Eisenhower's favorite golfing buddy and chief of staff, Sherman Adams, was forced out of office after reporters learned that, in exchange for political favors, he had accepted illicit gifts, most famously, a Vicuña coat. And he didn't declare it. And mm, I think he was out the next day. So you've got to be careful with Vicuña too. The slaughter of the increasingly rare Vicuña continued unabated. By the 1960s, the population had crashed once again to a few thousand across the entire Andes. If the species and its luxurious fleece were to survive, something clearly had to be done. Certainly up through the 60s and into the 70s, um, there was widespread uh, killing of vicuna, killing of vicuna in order to get the wool easier to and quicker to simply kill the animal and remove the fleece than to in any way um, manage that with live animals. Uh, to the point that uh, in the early 70s they were down to about five, six thousand individuals and that's really when CITES began to pay attention and the vicuna was eventually put on to CITES Appendix 1 which is the most protective category within the, um, the CITES um, toolbox. The CITES ban on all trade in vicuña produced some success, but poaching of the animal by the local population continued. You can understand why. You've got people who may be earning a dollar a day and if they manage to secure two kilos, so that would be six animals because each animal only produces about a third of a kilo of wool, uh, six animals worth is probably a year's, more than a year's income uh, for very poor rural people. The Peruvian government needed to find a way to motivate the inhabitants of the mountains to cooperate in preserving the region's most valuable resource. The uh, Peruvian authorities understood that they had to do something in order to keep this heritage alive in the country. And the association with the uh, uh, European uh, industries like us uh, might save the, the Vicuña one way, but save also the heritage and the, the, uh, the know-how of the people uh, how to breed Vicuñas. In 1987, CITES removed some of the trading restrictions, allowing fabrics obtained only from the shearing of living animals to be marketed internationally. If you shear the animal, you don't kill the animal, you just shear the animal once every two years in the case of Vicuña. After a hard-fought competition, Loro Piano and a local company based in Arequipa were granted contracts by the Peruvian government to return the precious fiber to the international market. It is early summer, high in the Peruvian Pampas, where Loro Piano has established a private natural reserve. It is the season of the biannual Chaco, shearing time for the vicuña. But before the shearing, the free-ranging vicuña have to be herded and caught. The Chaco is a poignant community undertaking, dating back to the time of the Inca. The local Negro Mayo have converged from many miles around to participate in the event. It is both celebration and thanksgiving. It begins with the scissor dance, an ancient ritual intrinsic to the Chaku. Before the dance, instruments have to be tuned, costumes carefully donned. Everyone from children to grandmothers has a role to play. Everyone has a costume to wear. Everyone as a cause to celebrate. <laughs> the costumes are exuberant, reflecting influences from both the Incas and more recently, the Spanish conquistadors. The pantheons of Andean gods have amalgamated with the theater of Christian saints. The scissor dance dates back to time immemorial, 
it is a celebration that honors both the Earth's fertility and the gods of the Andes who protect the community. The main instrument accompanying the dance is a pair of scissors, two pieces of metal which by tinkling and jingling of one upon the other are said to reproduce the language of tumbling stones in the Andean rivers. Although today it is hard not to believe that the scissors anticipate the shearing of the vicuña to come. Coming up, we witness the ancient Andean chuckle, the herding and capture, shearing and release of the rare vicuña. We visit Valsesia in northern Italy, where the fleece of the vicuña is transformed into one of the world's finest and rarest fabrics. We also drop in on the Milanese showroom of one of Europe's leading weavers and fashion houses, where we discover the most luxurious accessories and garments woven from the Vicuña's precious fleece. For hundreds of years before the Spanish conquest of Peru in 1532, the Inca people had managed their Vicuña population sustainably. Nearly 500 years later, with the animal teetering on the brink of extinction, conservationists have turned back to the original Inca model in a desperate bid to save the species. A rope over a mile in length, carried by hundreds of the local Indian farmers, stretches out across the hillside as far as the eye can see. They surge forward together, creating a living human fence. It is a tradition handed down from generation to generation, as old as the chaku itself. The plan is gradually to encircle the wild vicuña, scattered and hidden across the mountainous landscape, and to herd them in well-orchestrated steps into pens at the base of the mountains. The vicuña, on the other hand, is a wild animal who wants to stay that way. It darts left and right, this way and that, trying to outrun its captives or escape through one of the rocky passes that surround the mountains. But they are blocked by the herdsmen. There is no escape. And soon enough, most of the hunted animals are driven into the waking pens. Today's chuckle has been a success. So, I think it's beautiful. I've never seen a chuckle like this. The capture has taken all morning. More than 200 animals are penned into their enclosure, awaiting their turn to be sheared. Religion and cultural tradition play an important role in every chaku ceremony. Before the shearing begins, a marriage ceremony is performed between two young vicuña to bless the vicuña and pray to the gods for its continued survival. It is an intricate affair involving many traditional Inca beliefs and customs. The shearing itself is quick and painless. The fleece will grow back in a matter of months and the animals themselves do not appear unduly traumatized by their experience. Today, maybe in the end, is there are around 200,000 vicuñas and I think there is room for over a million. Obviously, we cannot develop a million heads by ourselves. But basically, my role is more to take the raw material, manufacture, and try to distribute to the right customers. Not that much to breed the raw material. I'm not a, a, a farmer. They say they are. They are breeders and, and farmers and experts. So to produce more raw material going forward can give a lot of possibility to the to the people here to live in a more let's say modern way, making their own money to give them a reason to stay here and not to move to, to cities. Seven thousand miles away, in northern Italy, the Loro Piano factory awaits the latest consignment of Vicuña fur. The precious fabric is bundled in Peru 
and shipped straight to the factory in Valsesia. Just four tons of vicuña fiber leaves Peru annually, in stark contrast to the three and a half thousand tons of the far coarser wool farmed from the alpaca. Processing is slow and complex, mainly due to the fine quality of the fleece. The, the hair of vicuña is so fine uh, in, in, in the average is between 12.5 to 13.5 micron. A micron is 1,000 of millimeter. So, uh, unfortunately, my hair or your hair could be 30 to 40 micron. They are 12.5, 13.5. And the touch is special because the touch of Vicuña is different than any other touch. When you touch a, a, a fabric uh, made by Vicuña, you have a different touch. The machines are state-of-the-art. The final textile has to be of the very highest quality. The vicuña wool is initially scoured to remove surface impurities. The carding process passes the clean and dry wool through a system of wire rollers, combing and straightening the fibers which are in turn layered into a continuous sheet of wool. Vicuña wool is seldom dyed, primarily because the wool already possesses its own unique golden color. The initial spinning of the wool creates a weak and delicate thread. This process is repeated many times, twisting and retwisting the wool until a strong and firm vicuña yarn has been produced. The method of weaving the yarn has not, in principle, altered in over a hundred years. The loom runs the vicuña yarn lengthways, the warp, and crosswise, the weft and by utilizing thousands of chattering wire eyelets, knits the two yarns together to form the final fabric. The value of this fabric on the retail market is so high, at least five times the price of silver, that every fiber of the wool must be perfect. Every fiber of the fabric is checked and any blemish removed. By international law, every roll of vicuña fabric is numbered and every inch of the material chronicled. And only then is the precious fabric allowed to leave the factory. Vicuña jackets will retail in London for around £4,000 and a sweater around £2,000. It is the very top end of the market. This is a Vicuña scarf in its natural colour. And for a scarf like this, you'll be paying around £500 something a bit bigger like a shawl is like a thousand pounds. And I think that these days people with money are looking for value, for value that will stay there forever. It's not just looking for what is fashionable right now and today and possibly next month is not going to be fashionable at all. People with real money are looking for long-term value. I think people that wear Vicuna are very much members of a very exclusive club, rich. The vicuña fleece typifies the essence of high-end luxury. And for companies like Loro Piana and others who manufacture and sell the fiber, it is a perfect balance of conservation and the luxury business working in partnership. Saving a species while creating and selling luxury products. When you think of a company like Loro Piana, in Italy and what they've done to save Vicuna. I'm sure we're going to see more and more of that. People who are aware that the planet is a precious thing just as luxury should be precious and the two thoughts should be put together so that everything that we're creating in a truly luxurious world should be things that have come, that have roots in sustainability. And so the question remains, is trade in Vicuna sustainable? There are welfare considerations, there are captive management considerations, there's the poaching consideration. I am concerned about all of those and they must uh, continue to be addressed. Otherwise, we're doing what I regard as the sort of slippery slope of, uh, of sustainable use. And that is, we say it's a good thing, we set up a model which looks great on paper, but the reality delivers something quite different. The reality in Peru today is that the precious vicuña has grown in numbers from a mere handful to well over a hundred thousand in less than 30 years. The partnership of conservation and big business has, for now, 
helped to save the species. As both partners in the equation understand, however, there is no room for complacency. It won't take much for climate change or human intervention to change that part of the world. Um, and obviously if you change the habitat, you change whatever lives on that habitat. And um, the vicuna, it, it would not take much for vicunas to disappear. But for now, at least, the little queen of the Andes would seem to be safe. Thank you.